Hello, this is Mrs. Kyler, and I'm here to talk to you today about Byron, Shelley, and Keats. There's Byron looking very exotic. There's Percy Bishy Shelley looking very poetic. And there's Keats looking very dreamy. These are three of the most passionate poets of the Romantic period. First of all, I'm going to tell you some key points about the destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron. First of all, it's in anapistic tetrameter. That means there are, in each line there are four feet with two unstressed syllables followed by one stressed syllable, as we see in this picture. The little x's are the unstressed syllable and the slashes are the stressed syllable. So when you see four slashes, you know that there are four anapests in each line. It's pretty interesting because the meter is mimetic. It actually sounds like the horse's galloping hoofs. If you read it out loud, you can hear it. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. It actually sounds like you can gallop right through that whole poem. It's pretty interesting. It's in rhyming couplets. Each line rhymes the next. Fold rhymes with gold. And also the whole poem is based on the biblical account in 2 Kings 18-19. to Secondly, Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote Ode to the West Wind. There's the definition of an ode. You can read it for yourself, but you can tell just by reading the, West, the poem that it's a long stanzaic poem. There's varying line lengths. The rhyme scheme is very intricate, and it's dealing with a serious subject. Um, so you can see that the wild, like the Ode to the Wild West Wind, very specific subject, the West Wind, is about the West Winds that bring change of season in England. Some key points. It follows the change of season, so go back and read the poem and see if you can tell which season each stanza is talking about. And it's relating it to all the changes that are happening in England, and to the world for that matter. And like many other romantic poems, the theme is mutability. You're mute mourning and accepting upheaval and change and having to grow and adjust to all the new things that are happening in the world. The whole poem is actually an apostrophe. It's addressing the wind as if it's a person. And in this poem, Shelley aligns himself with the wind, not so much the wind itself, but the things that the wind blows around. He feels like a dried up leaf being blown about by something bigger than he and something, you know, by events that are greater than he can bear. Um, he's dried up. He's lost his poetic energy. He's seeking inspiration from the wind, just like, you know, in Invocation of the Muse that we read about with the ethics, you know, breathe on me, wind revive me as a poet. Um, and also one of the things that had happened recently in his life was that he had lost a child. Uh, many critics kind of pick on that line, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed, calling it uncharacteristically maudlin for Shelley. But he had gone through a lot of tragedy. He probably did feel that way. Okay, finally, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, there's, there's Keats. Um, the whole poem describes the way the poet feels when hearing the simple English translation of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey for the first time. Before that, he had just read the difficult ancient Greek, um, Greek renditions of the big, huge epics. Um, the form of the poem is an Italian sonnet. There is a slight historical error. The poem describes Cortes discovering the Pacific Ocean when, in fact, it was really Balboa. And there are a couple of similes at the end. The way he feels when he reads the English translation, he feels like an astronomer discovering a new planet, or Cortez discovering a new part of the world. He's discovered a whole new world in this poem, I mean, in this translation. So just a couple of more key points. Um, when he talks about realms of gold, he's talking about the lining of the books. So a lot of times old books have that gold threading on the outside edges. So he's actually traveling in books. And books are like his world, so he can discover new things in those books. Also remember, it's an Italian sonnet, so it's made up of an octave and a sestet. The first eight lines, the octave, presents a quandary. How do I enjoy these ancient works when I first must fight with Greek text? And the final sestet, the six lines, presents the solution. The solution is a reading of Chapman's brilliant English translation. Now I can truly enjoy the wonders of the Iliad and Odyssey. Interestingly, the Volta, right there, usually it begins at the beginning of the Sestet, but here it actually comes a little early in the octave, uh, actually on the seventh line, where he says, 
Um, then I felt, right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, the word yet is kind of where it starts, the volta. Why is pointing there? Uh, so at the end, there are some similes. He feels like an astronomer discovering a new planet. He feels like Cortez. Yes, there's that historical error. It should have been Balboa. But Keats, you're brilliant. You can rewrite history anytime you want. Thanks. Bye.